He'll be able to say, I'll be there. Let's stand as we say.
receive our Lord's tithes and offerings.
seated. And uh, we have some more special music. Uh, Come on. Come on. Do a special for us. Well, I'm going to go ahead and just apologize for the bad weather. <laughs>
And uh, so it was a literal physical body, but it was glorified and somehow it's going to be fit for eternity. Um, so that's the kind of body we're going to have. Uh, will I know who is in heaven and who isn't? And I think we will. I think we're going to know people who are not there. And so the next question is, will it cause me sorrow? And I believe no. I believe that heaven is a place in which we will understand perfectly the holiness, righteousness, justice of God, the grace, love, and mercy of God to such an extent uh, that it's not going to cause sorrow. Uh, heaven is a place of total satisfaction. There will be no more wishing or wanting or worrying. Uh, it's a place of knowledge and understanding. And, and just like the saints in the book of Revelation, even <coughs> while terrible tribulation and judgments are going on and wrath is poured out and... Hundreds and thousands of people's lives are being destroyed, yet God is being praised because all of his judgments and, and, and works are righteous and just, and they're praising God. And I think we will have a complete understanding of the ways of God, not, not the eternal, infinite ways of God, but we will have enough understanding and knowledge that there will be no sorrow uh, about what's missing. It's a place of ecstasy and joy, a place of new beginning. And so uh, we will not be sorrowing over anything. Uh, will there be time and eternity? Some people think that those two concepts don't go together. Yes, we will always be creatures. We will be resurrected, glorified creatures, but creatures are always uh, in relation to time. And, and uh, there will be a succession of events, I believe, in heaven. Uh, the gates of the heaven are open so people can come in and out. We have to go in before you go out. That succession of events, that's measured by, that's time. Now it may not be measured uh, like we have watches and clocks today by the hours of the minutes, but there will be a succession of time. And uh, even Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7 talks about the ages to come, that there will be a succession of time. Uh, what will I be doing forever? And that's where we want to finish up today. What will I do forever? This is one of the things that really baffled me as a youngster. I knew I didn't want to go to hell. But I kept wondering, do I really, am I really going to enjoy heaven? I really, I, I worried about that. I said, I honestly don't know if I'm going to enjoy heaven. Before we even get to heaven, no, let me tell you. There are two alternatives, smoking or non-smoking, your choice. It doesn't really have to do with who smoke or who doesn't smoke. It's, 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 our eternal, uh, those who are not written in the Lamb's book of life, those who have not trusted in Christ implicitly for their salvation, will spend eternity in a burning lake of fire. It's called hell, Gehenna. Okay? It is a real, literal place, contrary to what I've heard the Pope has said recently. Um, and I don't have time to talk there, but you go to Matthew chapter 24 and 25, and, and where God talks about uh, uh, entering to the joy of my Lord, uh, or depart from me into the eternal lake of fire. Uh, the same, it, it's eternity, it's eternal, it, it's real, it's literal. And so those are the only two options. But the question that we want to deal with today is, what will I be doing as Christians? What will I be doing in heaven? And that's what really bothered me because poets and musicians and people have painted pictures of heaven from really the third century on, from Augustine to Dante and many in between, and their picture, their view of heaven was this beatific, angelic, mystical vision of, like this, angel-like creatures in clouds strumming hearts. And I hate harp music. <laughs> I, I wouldn't find that appealing at all. And if that's what heaven is like, I honestly am not sure I want to go. Of course, I don't want the other option either. So that really bothered me as a child growing up. But is that really what heaven is like? It's just a big banjo. <laughs> it's not the same as Rogue. That's kindling. Yeah. So, but this view of heaven is the common view. It is the 90% of Americans, if they poll them, what's heaven going to be like? This is what they tell you. That 
we're going to be transported into some uh, mystical, ethereal, heaven-like, cloudy-like, celestial-like, light place. And um, we're going to have uh, maybe like an angelic spirit body of some kind, uh, or souls floating around, or sometimes you see the picture of a soul with a crown or something on it, floating around. Uh, and that uh, in heaven, the redeemed ones, the righteous, the, the saved people, are going to be there, and we're going to just stand aghast at the presence of God. Uh, we're going to stand there with our eyes glazed over in a perpetual trance, fixated on the glory of God. Our mouths gaping open. Well, we've got time for singing and harping too. But, but we're standing there in the presence of God and viewing His glory enraptured, in trance, like angelic zombies. And then that's all we do. That's all I need to do. That's all I ever will do is stand there aghast at His presence. And I suggest to you that that is totally wrong. That's not what heaven is going to be like. A lot of problems with this view. Let's go back to Christ's resurrection. Why did Christ have a physical body? Why was Christ's resurrection so important? A physical resurrection, his body. Look, this is where he laid him. He's not here. He's risen, as he said. Forty days he showed himself alive through many indisputable, unmistakable arguments, proofs. Look at my hands, look at my feet, look at my side. This is me, eating, drinking with his disciples, going in and out, teaching. They were witnesses, they saw him, they touched him, they handled him. Then he ascended into glory. This same Jesus, who's taken up from you, will so come in like manner. That Jesus had a resurrected body, 1 Corinthians 15. Actually, there's a lot of passages but scripture places a heavy emphasis on that truth of a resurrected, a bodily, literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he, the Lamb of God, will have that resurrected body for all eternity. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits, first fruits of them who sleep in Jesus. So then the next question is, why is it so important that we have a resurrected body in heaven? You see, if it's just that we have these souls that stand aghast at the presence and glory of God and do nothing but bob around in the clouds, then we surely don't need bodies. And yet this was one of the great truths of the New Testament, the foundation of the apostles' preaching, the resurrection of Christ and the future resurrection of the believer. That's a blessed hope. Our bodies will be raised. That's a lot of waste on God's part if he's going to have to take the time and energy to gather up all these bodies from the ground, the dust in which they've decayed, the seas in which they've been disintegrated, the fish who ate them, all dissolved, and God's going to have to put all these bodies, reconstitute, recollect, gather them all together, reorganize them into our bodies, and make them fit for eternal habitation. Why? For what? There's a purpose. God created us originally out of the dust of the ground in his image and that he will resurrect our bodies out of the ground and eternally they will be conformed to his image. There's a purpose. What's the sense of God's uh, recreating the earth? We know from 2 Peter chapter 3 as well as from Revelation chapter 21, 22 that the end of at uh, the end of this world, God is going to burn up the earth. There's going to be a great conflagration in which he burns over and recreates heaven and earth. Why does he do that? What's the sense? If we're just going to be floating around in clouds in mystical ghost-like soul bodies, and that's all there is, why is the importance of a new earth? But God has that. Not only the original creation, but we have a new heaven and a new earth in which dwells nothing but righteousness. And that is where our abode is going to be. What was the purpose of the original material creation? Why did God create everything right from the beginning out of 
not mythical, ethereal, angelic souls, but why did God bring into being a literal, physical, material world? And he created man out of the dust of the ground in his image and, and breathed into him the breath of life. And then he planted a garden in Eden and put man there to keep it and to till it and to reproduce and to further his glory. And, and he, he made trees. He made trees and fruits and vegetables and, and flowers that could be smelled, that were fragrant and touched and they were beautiful to look at, it says in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And fruit that could be eaten, every tree of the garden was for man, except for the one. And it had delicious fruit that could be eaten and succulent and juice running down Adam and Eve's chin. Why did God create man like and he created them in a physical environment. And he gave them animals to enjoy, to amuse themselves with, to employ, to be useful for man, to name. What was the purpose of animals? And physical things. And he gave to Adam and Eve and to all mankind. He gave health and strength. And he gave abilities and gifts and uh, uh, skills so that they could do physical things like work. <laughs> and tend the garden, and keep it, and till it. Why did God do that? Jump ahead from Genesis chapters 1 and 2 in our Bibles to the very end of our Bibles, Revelation chapters 21 and 22, and what do we find? We find a recreation, a new heaven, and a new earth. God, from the beginning, said, this is good. It's all very good. It's exactly, it's precisely what I want. And now... Sin, of course, came, and all this chaos and wreck, and a redeemer came, and God's original plan now is to recreate a new heaven and a new earth with glorified, redeemed mankind without a curse. And so that's what we end up with in Revelation 21 and 22, the abode, the eternal abode of God and his people in a material world it's material, but it's also spiritual. It's interesting because that's what we had at the beginning, isn't it? God's world in creation was a perfect blend of was spiritual and material, and they weren't; those aren't contradictory to each other. Uh, many of the early Greek philosophers felt that material and spiritual were diametrically opposed. You can't have material and spiritual. Well, God says you can, and it's all good because I created it, and this is what I want. And so you had spirituality and material. You had man in, in the garden as God's direct creation, magnifying and glorifying God in his image. You had man walking with God in the cool of the garden, intimate, personal fellowship with the almighty creator. That's spirituality. That's what we're going to enjoy in the end, Revelation 22 and 20, uh, 21 and 22. And we shall see him face to face. All right? Adam and Eve. But you had also material world, physical world, literal world. And we have that also in Revelation 21 and 22. So you have a perfect blend of the material and the immaterial. And, and when we get to Revelation 21 and 22, it's going to be the resurrected saints face to face with their resurrected Lord in this new heaven and new earth. The original creation had this spiritual dimension. Let me back up one. Where they walked and talked with God in personal, perfect fellowship. We can't even fathom that now, can we? Because we don't, I suppose we sing that song, I come to the garden alone and he talks with me and walks with me. And that intimate fellowship that we share with Christ. And there are moments where we get a glimpse of what it might be like in, in heaven, but we don't have that here. Adam and Eve had that that perfect union and fellowship with Christ. But, but part of their glorifying God was not that they just stood aghast at God's presence, was it? In fact, that's interesting because Adam and Eve, they walked with God. They're, they didn't stand there and sing hallelujah choruses. They walked and talked with God in the garden. 
in the garden, in the cool of the day. The whole scriptures are putting this in a situation where man was created to enjoy God in an environment of materiality in which they not only enjoyed God's presence and his fellowship, but they also enjoyed the things that God has created for them. They're, part of their glorifying God and enjoying him forever was enjoying what God has created for them. The garden, the fruits, the trees, the animals, each other. The unity, the fellowship that Adam and Eve had with one another. This is all part of what God has created. It's part of how man glorifies God is to enjoy that. In fact, part of what's necessary for, for man to glorify God is that he actually turn his gaze away from God and tend to some of the things that God told him to take care of. Right? God told, this is before there any sin, in the perfect environment, God planted them in the garden and told them to keep it and to till it. In other words, there was a time for Adam and Eve to walk and talk with God. There was also a time for them, in this perfect created earth, for them to be busy tilling in the garden and keeping it. In fact, naming the animals was one of the things that Adam had to do. So part of Adam's glorifying God, enjoying him forever, if we put it in those terms, is that he had to turn his gaze away from God. He couldn't stand there and gawk in his presence. And at some point, he had to turn his attention and give his attention to the task that God gave him. Again, it was for the glory of God. But he had tasks to do. And in fact, if Adam refused to name the animals, and this is in Genesis chapter 2, he would be sinning by disobeying God. And that's not glorify God. And he would also miss an opportunity to glorify God by performing these tasks for the glory of God. What I'm trying to under, you to understand is that the way God created the original, Adam and Eve, the earth, the garden, and the material aspect, that the material and the spiritual were wed in one and they go hand in hand. And Adam and Eve, to enjoy God and to glorify and honor him, weren't just standing there aghast at his presence and uh, having their hands raised or on the ground. Uh, it, no, they were busy walking, talking, enjoying the garden and tilling it and working and serving him. That all comprised their worship of God, their, their glorifying him. And, and I believe it's a reflection of what we will be doing in eternity. And, of course, they had to tend and keep the garden. That was also part of it. Which, as we go through the scriptures now, we, we started with Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22 from the beginning of the scripture and how it ends, the end, in eternity. We say materiality, spirituality, material, spiritual. They go hand in hand. And you know what? Throughout the whole middle, what's all the rest of the scriptures about? Man glorifying God through his proper imaging of God, through his obeying of God, and him serving God. That's why the whole Bible is stories. It's stories about God's people and how they properly image God, act like God, Christ-like, God-like, if you will, and how they obeyed God, did what he said, carried out his commandments, and how they served him, honored him by their doing, performing tasks for his glory. And, and of course, there's the story of redemption throughout all the scripture, from the fall of man to the redemption of man in the final. But, but everything else is about how man should, or is, or isn't, glorifying God by those three things. Imaging him, obeying him, serving him. We come to the New Testament, we find out that's exactly what the word worship means. To worship God. There's three different words in uh, the New Testament, Greek words, that mean worship or that are sometimes translated <laughs> worship. Uh, you've got the word proskuneo. Proskuneo is a word which means to, to, to bow down towards, to pay obeisance to. It's a, it's a pros towards, and, and it's a term of, of veneration, adoration. You've got the word sibo, sibo mai, and it's the same idea to venerate, to adore. And then you've got another word, latreo, and that word is a word which means to serve. 
It's interesting that the, the other two words are used, uh, well, proskenet was the dominant word throughout the Old Testament, but as we come into the New Testament, we find that there is conspicuously absent two of those words, sibo and proskeneo. The only word that we really have used of true worship in the New Testament is the word latrepo, to serve. You want to worship the Lord? You serve the Lord. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. This is worship. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable latrepo. Service. Some by translations translate it worship because it, it does mean that, but it means to, to worship God by serving Him. If you turn over in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, and I know we're not looking at a lot of scriptures, or we're sort of looking at scripture as a whole here this morning and some things, but Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, and he's talking in, the, in, in verses just previous to this. Uh, 26 and 27, he's talking about shaking the earth once more. Um, God is going to shake the earth once more and remove all those things being shaken. Uh, but then he says in verse 28, Hebrews 12, 20, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That's serving. That's what we're looking for. God wants us to be serving. That's... In, in light of the coming kingdom and what we're going to be doing in eternity, we should be serving now. Adam and Eve were serving. And, and that's what God wants us to do now. John chapter 14. Uh, you probably recall that verse. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me. Do you? You love me? Then I want you just to bow your knees and stand here like this. No, that's not what he says. If you love me, I want you to obey me. In fact, in verse 21, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. How do we, how do we show God we love him? We obey him. We keep his commandments. That's how we do it. It's, I know this, and the reason I have to emphasize this is because it, there's such a false teaching today and false practice uh, about worship is going to church on Sunday and singing along with the worship team at the worship service. And now you got your worship done. No. In fact, if, if you're not obeying God throughout the week, if you're not correctly imaging Him, acting like God... Loving and kind and merciful and true and just and pure. If you're not imaging God in His likeness and obeying Him and serving Him throughout the week, then when you come on Sunday and you praise Him, it's hooey to God and it makes Him sick. Amen. Amen. So that's what it says in Isaiah. It says in a number of places. God is absolutely sick. He says, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to, your prayers, your songs, I don't want to hear it. It makes me sick to my stomach, He says. Because. The worship is our lives. 24 hours a day, we present our lives as a living sacrifice. That's our worship. And we join Sunday, and we sing his praises. Yes, that's a, that's a microscopic portion of it. And I suggest to you that even in eternity, our imaging of God, of course, that's going to be perfect then, isn't it? We'll have glorified bodies. We will be conformed to his image, Romans 8, 20, 29, 30, what we're saved for that will be perfect. And we will obey his will, won't we? We will keep his commandments perfectly. Isn't that what we've been praying? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you know what? In eternity, in the new earth, that will be fulfilled perfectly. And we will do his will perfectly. And we will perform his bidding. We will serve him throughout eternity. We're going to be active, busy for the Lord throughout eternity. To our worship, God is glorified in his works, his creations, his deeds. We've, again, this is throughout, not only did Adam and Eve enjoy God and glorify him, in, in by enjoying the creation that he provided, by obeying him, as well as by walking and talking with him. He's glorified by the task we perform to his glory. When we accurately image God, he's glorified. When we obey and keep his commandments and do his will. 
You see, a Christian worships God more by their obedience during the week than they do by singing on Sunday. Yes. Not that our singing should be minimized. That's a, that's a very important part of, of our corporate gathering. But, but our true worship is the other, how many, how many hours in a week? 256? The other 255 hours in a week is, is our worship. A Christian mother glorifies God by her loving submission to her husband, by providing for her family, meals, clothes, comfort, and security, by training her children in godliness. Why, why does she glorify God in doing that? Because that's what God has commanded her, and when she keeps her commands, she's showing love. She glorifies Him. A Christian worker glorifies God, not because he's got a Jesus loves you sticker on his desk. A Christian worker glorifies God, honors Him, when he comes to work on time, and when he puts in a hard day's work, an honest day's work, and is ingenious and industrious, and, 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 and is carrying on his work in a manner of integrity for his boss. Why? Because that's what God has told the Christian worker to do. And thus he glorifies God. A Christian surgeon glorifies God best, not because he's holding a prayer meeting in the operating room, but because he operates with all of his God-given skills to keep a person alive. A Christian auto mechanic glorifies God best, not by whistling amazing grace and laying hands on the car, <laughs> but because he uses his skills that God has given him and he fixes that car to the best of his ability to honor his boss, to do good for the, the owner of the car, and to do it as inexpensively and as honestly as possible. Because that's what God calls on Christian mechanics to do. Now, if he's a father, he also has to go home and be a loving father and train his children. He has to be a loving spouse, a, a head of a home, and, and there's a lot of other things. But, but we, when we fulfill the task that God has given us, we are glorifying him. A Christian glorifies God by their a courteous and attentive driving. Yeah. Let me pause here a minute. <laughs> you get in your car and you go to work tomorrow morning, you got a half hour to glorify God. Maybe that's what takes you to commute to work. How you drive, the courtesy you show other drivers, how well you abide by the laws of the land. You see a person in need on the side of the road, are you the good Samaritan who stops and helps you to drive on by? I suggest God is glorified when you pull over and stop, whether it's a pedestrian in need, it's an old lady pushing a cart up her driveway, or someone with the car broke down, you stop. No, no, I'm a Christian. I'm on my way to work. I'm barreling air. I'm listening to K Love singing, Jesus loves me. You know what? If you don't stop to help a person in need, you're not glorifying God. A Christian worships the Lord as much or maybe more so by visiting the fatherless and the widows in their affliction than they do by coming to church on Sunday and singing hallelujah and waving their hands. Why? Because God said to this my people that this is pure religion and undefiled to visit the fatherless and the widows in affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world so that holiness of life and that fulfilling the commands that God has given us to do that is what honors and glorifies him and I suggest to you it's what's going to glorify him throughout eternity as God in eternity, the new heaven, the new created earth, in our new resurrected bodies, in a curseless world, when we live and serve and perform the task that I believe God is going to be giving us to perform throughout eternity, we will be honoring and glorifying Him. Now, no doubt there will be times, just like Adam, when we'll be walking and talking with Christ. And we will be in intimate fellowship and we will be praising and we will, there will be times that you and I are going to join our voices to the heavenly choir and we're going to sing hallelujah, oh holy to the lamb and everything else. 
and, and we'll be joined with the apostles and the prophets and the 24 elders and the angels, and man, it's going to be some celestial choir, and we're going to be singing his praises. But there's also going to be a lot of other times when he has tasks for us to do, and that requires us turning our gaze away from that aspect and paying attention to the people around us and the task that God has given us to do. We serve him. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 21 and 22. By the way, in this life, we use the word secular and sacred. Some things are sacred, spiritual. We go to church, we pray, we, we're, we put ourselves in a moment or time. I'm taking communion. This is a sacred, spiritual time, right? And then other things are secular. I'm, I'm just going to work. I'm changing the kid's diaper. I'm doing housework. I'm uh, changing the oil in the car. That's secular. That's mundane daily tasks. And you and I oftentimes separate the secular and the sacred. God does not. He wants every aspect of our life to bring him glory. Every moment of every day, no matter what I'm doing, I need to be doing for his glory. And so really, for the Christian, there should be no such thing as a difference between secular and sacred. Just like in Adam and Eve's world. In a perfect environment, there Adam and Eve, whatever they were doing, whether they were tending and tilling the garden, or reproducing... Or walking with God in the cool of the garden. It didn't matter. It was all spiritual. It was all sac sacred. That's the way it's going to be in eternity. But you know, even now in our lives, that's the way it ought to be. You go to work. Why do I work? And how do I act when I work? What is my purpose for working? Is my character showing? Am I imaging God? Am I obeying God and how I deal with the employees and my boss? And the money I earn is that, recognize that it's God's money. And so I've earned this not to hoard myself in big, build bigger barns, but, but so that I can support my family and provide for God's ministry and give to people in need. Everything in life is sacred. There's, we shouldn't even use the word secular because it's not belong to us. Mm -hmm. The naming of the animals, that was sacred. So what will we do forever in heaven? Well, I believe as it was in Adam and Eve, as it is now, and as it, will, as it says in Revelation 21, 22, it's going to be the same. We will honor and glorify and worship God and enjoy Him forever by imaging Him, obeying Him, and performing tasks to His glory, serving Him. As I mentioned, there will be times where we join in the heavenly choir and sing and adore and praise Him. There will be time for us to cast our crowns before Him and render to Him. And probably uh, we will be on our hands and our faces praising Him. And that's awesome. Maybe we'll be at times dancing and jumping up and down for joy, rejoicing in His goodness. But there will be times when we do that. Our fellowship with God and our fellowship with one another in perfect Fellowship, un, unhindered uh, Christian fellowship in heaven. Uh, that's going to be something blissful, isn't it? Uh, as we accurately image God, and we will be glorified and sinless, and we'll do that as we obey his will. Notice what it says here in verse 3 of, of Revelation chapter 22. Talking about this new heaven, this new earth, the new city of Jerusalem. Verse 3 says, there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants, his doulos, his doulos, his servants, shall serve him. The trail. That's what we're going to be doing forever. Part of it, serving him. Serving him. Um, and by the way, I think that passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7 where it says and that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in us. That ages to come, I think it not only hints of successive generations of something going on in eternity, but I think it suggests or hints of 
new, new plans and dispensations in God's programs for God's people for eternity. Things are going to be new and different and exciting forever. Notice over chapter 21 of Revelation, uh, verse 24. That was back at verse 23. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And notice this, verse 24. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. This is in the new heaven and new earth. There's going to be ethnos, these, these uh, where it says nations, ethnicities. Apparently in our resurrected bodies, I don't fully understand this, and maybe this isn't how it, maybe in our fully resurrected new bodies, we're still going to have our ethnical distinctions. That there'll be Africans and Indians and and uh, Swedish people, I don't know. Or, or that in the, the new heaven, the new earth, that the multitudes of saints will be, will be grouped somehow into uh, these new people groups. I don't know. <laughs> but the nations of the earth, this is the new heaven, new earth. And then it talks about the kings of the earth. Some people are going to have king, kings. Well, we'll all be kings and priests. But it says it says they're going to bring the glory and honor unto it. That's says of the city. So, I, and, and this is again, um, we're not giving great detail. This is what I believe: is that in this new heaven, new earth, we're going to be having skills and, and abilities and labors. And by the way, all the tasks that God asks us to perform and what we do, tending and tilling. The new heaven and new earth is going to be joyous. There's going to be no sweat, no weeds, no thorns, thistles, mosquitoes. It is going to be a delight to us to do everything, to carry out the will of God and perform these tasks for his glory. And as we do that, this fruitful, new, beautiful earth, as it produces whatever we're producing out of it, tending, we're going to be bringing these gifts, offerings, tributes to the city, to the Lamb. Maybe they're symbols of we're doing what you asked, God, and here are some of the blessings of the land out there. Bring it into the city to present to the land. Like, like offerings or something. I don't know. But, but we're going to be busy serving and bringing the, 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 the wealth and the joys and the goodness of God's land, the new heaven and new earth, to show him. Show off, I don't know, to the people of the land. But they do bring their glory and honor into this new city. Symbols of God's redeemed earth for his glory. So yeah, we're not going to be floating spirits, <laughs> bobbing on clouds, harping, standing, gazing at his glory for billions and gazillions of years. There's going to be new projects and things where we employ our resurrected bodies, our minds, our glorified minds, our, our, the imagination and creativity and industry that he created with us. All sinless now, we're going to employ that for his glory in the new heaven and new earth. It's going to be exciting. And we're going to be active and productive. It's all going to be for his glory and his enjoyment forever. And yes, there will be time for all of us to walk with him and talk with him and see him face to face. And we're going to be enjoying each other's company as well. And Paul and Peter and John and Jonah. And I'll have a few stories to tell Jonah too. I got some fish stories to tell. <laughs> But what we, what God expected Adam and Eve to do in the garden, and what we will be doing for eternity, we ought to be busy doing now. Worshiping, serving, imaging Him, living every moment for His glory, now. Because that's what worship is now.
as it was in the garden, and so will be for them. Heavenly Father, thank you for sharing just little glimpses of what eternity is going to be like. Obviously, we don't, we can't understand the half of it. Uh, and, and as your scripture says, eye has not seen nor ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them who love him. We can't, uh, we, we don't know a half of it, Lord, but, but we're thankful for the little bit, the glimpses that we have, and, and we do. We look forward to that day when uh, the roll is called up yonder and we'll be there in glory with you forever. So, Father, in the meanwhile, help us to be faithful servants, honoring, glorifying you every moment of the day. We praise you for this and thank you and ask the Lord that you, your spirit would invigorate us and motivate us. Uh, as we grow each day. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, John says something interesting in 1 John. He says, he who has this hope in him purifies himself. The hope, that is, of that eternity with Christ, the hope of being with him, Jesus in eternity, purifies himself. In other words, a pastor doesn't need to beat people over the head with the law. No. We ought to receive motivation when we see what our eternity is to be with Christ. That ought to spur us on and motivate us to live a pure life now. To live for His glory. Let's have a go at it. All right, let's take our hymn books and we'll close with singing hymn number 506. Meet me there. Meet me there. 506. And I ask you to join me. So stand. We'll sing the first and last. On the happy go 